Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd really love to, to thank Howard for organizing the session um, and uh, the tag organizers for, for accepting the session. The first one on linear earthworks, as far as I know, um, and our previous uh, speakers, um, particularly Paul, who now makes me want to just throw my paper away and do something completely different <laughs> because I could have gone down um, some of the routes that you were doing, but um, I've, I've done something a little different. Um, as my title and abstract indicate, I'm, I'm here to talk about a linear earthwork that is best known for its pre-medieval origins. The Antonine Wall is the remains of Imperial Rome's one-time northwest frontier in central Scotland, and since 2008, it's been part of the expanding multinational frontiers of the Roman Empire UNESCO World Heritage Site. Although the wall has a lower popular profile than its counterparts in England and, and Germany, um, it has nevertheless been the object of significant study, with a research tradition that has resulted in a number of syntheses. These focus on the wall's initial period of construction, functional operation, and abandonment, as well as the unique characteristics that make it what David Brees has called the most complex and highly developed of all frontiers constructed by the Roman army. Before we get too far, though, um, let me provide just a little bit of a background. So the Antonine Wall came relatively early in Rome's establishment of artificial frontiers. And this is a phenomenon that really began in the reign of the Emperor Hadrian. Um, Hadrian's Wall was certainly under construction in the early AD 120s when that emperor visited Britain. Um, and recent arguments have suggested that the decision may have actually been made as early as AD 118, corresponding with dendrochronology dates of AD 119 to 20 for the timber palisade in Germany as well. And uh, upon Hadrian's death, his successor, Antoninus Pius, continued establishing linear barriers, and in the case of Britain, moved the frontier from the Tyne Solway to the Fourth Clyde. Now this advance required a military campaign that took place in AD 139 to 142, and which was commemorated by coins of A.D. 143, when Antoninus was proclaimed Imperator for the victory. Now, the new wall was constructed uh, starting around A.D. 142, and it was occupied only for about 20 years. The sole surviving classical text to spec specifically mention the wall provides important details, indicating that it was constructed of turf and was built in the government governorship of Lalius Urbicus. Now, it may have taken 12 years to complete construction for a wall that was actually began construction, was used and abandoned all within a period of only about 20 years. Um, and by the time to the decision to abandon the wall was made around AD 158, um, based on epigraphic evidence for rebuilding on Hadrian's wall, the process of abandonment may have stretched over six years to AD 164 or just a little later. Now from this point, Hadrian's Wall was restored and it served as the primary frontier of Roman um, Britain until the early 5th century. Now as with many other ancient frontiers, the Antonine Wall was a complex of various interconnected features. These can be classified as either linear components that stretch along most of its length or as additional installations occurring at specific points along this line. While public perception of the term wall often revolves around an enclosing structure or rampart, the term Antonine wall is used by scholars and heritage managers to refer to this collection of interrelated features, of which the rampart is but one. So this is similar to Hadrian's wall, which consists of more than the iconic stone curtain. Now, recent archaeometric analysis that we've been leading at Canterbury published um, just a couple of months ago in the Journal of Roman Archaeology, if you're interested, um, has actually recalculated the Antonine Wall's length from the commonly reported 60 kilometers to a more precise 62.03 kilometers. Um, what we've done here is we've actually taken the, li the, the elevational data from the, the LIDAR data. Um, we've actually re-measured the wall's distance in three dimensions, accounting for the landscape's undulating topography. You'll have to read the paper or, or, or ask me later for what the implications of that are. But along this line, there are five key linear, linear features. The primary defining components are the ramparts and the ditch. 
the latter of which, the ditch, remains the most visible surviving element. In fact, for most of the length of the wall, that's the only part that you can see. And in my previous slide here, here we have the rampart, we've got a little bit of the berm, and we've got the ditch, and then this upcast mound. So this is actually looking from south to north, whereas my next slide has actually reversed it. Now the rampart was built of turf or earth um, and clay atop a curbstone base. It ranged in width from about 4.3 to 4.8 meters. It may have reached a height of at least three meters. Um, and there could have been a, uh, a wooden breastwork on the top of it, but we're ent not entirely sure. Now in addition to these linear components, there are a range of installations that punctuate the line. So these include 17 identified forts, most with um, attached annexes, nine, um, possibly 10 now, um, smaller fortlets, six unusual rampart extensions that we otherwise can't explain, um, and three minor enclosures that otherwise do not fit one of the other categories. Excavation has demonstrated that some of these installations were contemporary with the rampart. A few were constructed in anticipation of the rampart, while others were added after the rampart's completion, all within a 20-year lifespan. Now, an analysis of the discourse of Antonine Wall research has allowed for the identification of four overarching themes. One was the wall's location <laughs> and structural anatomy. Two is its historical sequence and relationship to the broader history of Roman Britain. Third is the planning and building of the wall, as you can see, um, a, a quite complex attempt to reconstruct here. Um, and four was the wall's overall purpose. Was it for defense? Was it for controlling the movement of people or goods? Now these topics are tightly intertwined. And while much attention has been paid to minute details of anatomy and hypothetical reconstruction of the wall's plan and building program, this attention is generally seen as necessary for understanding both the Antonine Wall's place in a larger historical context and for understanding its purpose. While these may be identified as the dominant concerns, they have by no means been the only ones, and there have been several specialized studies carried out in other areas. Crucially though, traditional Antonine Wall research has very rigidly constrained the monument into the category of Roman frontier, with all of the Roman military emphasis that this category is assumed. As also noted for Hadrian's Wall, this research has emphasized in-depth documentation, developing complete and comprehensive knowledge, or that's the, the main aim, through the identification of identifying gaps in our knowledge and attempting to fill those gaps. We have indeed learned a lot about the details of this particular Roman frontier and about the Roman military more broadly from these studies. And I must be careful to say that there's still an awful lot that we need to know about the wall itself and about the Roman military. But what about non-Roman, non-military, and even non-Roman period interaction with the wall? Now in the face of that research tradition that I just briefly summarized, and the various external and internal critiques that have been provided for Roman frontier studies, and the growing body of literature on Hadrian's walls continued significance beyond the Roman period, I completed my PhD on the Antonine Wall from a new diachronic perspective. And in this paper, I'm just providing a really short summary of that research, with, uh, along with some additional thoughts that I've been developing as I'm moving that toward uh, final publication. Now, most importantly, I'd like to propose a new diachronic framework that can accommodate both the traditional Roman frontier concerns, but also themes that are emerging from my new investigation of the wall's wider biography. Now, this is going to look beyond the period and themes that have characterized the Antonine Wall's research tradition um, and situate it within the recent discourse on the afterlife or cultural biography of Roman frontiers. Although this agenda has been particularly pursued for Hadrian's Wall, comparatively little research has been undertaken for the Antonine Wall or any of the other frontiers of the Roman Empire. Now I argue that the traditional research framework 
artificially elides time between the present of modern investigation and the past of the Roman period, leaving those intervening post-Roman centuries comparatively unexplored and largely absent from both academic discourse and public presentations of the monument's contemporary significance. Now, my proposed new framework, on the other hand, rejects the constraints imposed by the chronological, that being Roman, Antonine, and typological, being frontier, military parameters of viewing the wall as a monument and instead builds upon place theories most fully developed within humanistic geography and philosophy in order to reframe the wall as a place that exists in the present and for which contemporary meaning and significance derives from an accumulation of memories and experiences over the long durée. Now this situates the wall not only within the context of investigations of the afterlives of Roman frontiers, but also within efforts um, to develop new approaches to the archeology span of place. Now my framework conceptually frames the wall under three separate titles in a broad chronological sequence of phases, starting with the Vallum Antonini, um, moving on to what I call Grimmestyke or Gramsdyke, Grimm's Ditch, all sorts of ways you could potentially pronounce that, um, to finally the Antonine Wall. And I'm going to go through these quite briefly here. But the Vallum Antonini, this phase, I think, refers to the wall in the Roman period. It's the object of research for traditional Roman frontier scholars. Um, this represents the Antonine Wall's original life as a functioning military frontier circa AD 140 to 160, with some additional leeway, per perhaps, for potential but structurally unsubstantiated later Roman activities. Now, this phase has been the primary focus of Antonine Wall research under its traditional discourse, and the name <coughs> derives um, from inscriptions found along its length. In direct translation, Vallum Antonini is the Antonine Wall. Um, but the use of a Latin form underscores the Roman period focus here. And it may actually reflect the name in use by the soldiers who built and manned the frontier. The wall's distant slabs, for example, which you have a 3D scanned copy here as well, um, directly record the distances of rampart, or so we believe, that were constructed by each working um, party of the Roman legions. Um, they usually state the distances that they built as Opus Valley, or the work of the wall, along with the Emperor Antoninus Pius's name. So it is, hope, it is to be hoped that continued research in this phase, research on the, the Vallum Antonini, um, will not only address the themes and unanswered questions of its long-standing research tradition, but also more vigorously respond to the concerns of internal and external critiques of Roman frontier studies. And in particular for this period, I think it's essential that the sh focus shift beyond the structural remains and logistical arrangements of the Roman military in order to investigate wider aspects of life and interaction within this frontier zone in the context of Scotland's long pre- and post-Roman Iron Age. Now the second phase that I'd like to propose is Grimmest Dyke or Graham's Dyke. This refers to the walls in the post-Roman centuries. And I've adopted this name, particularly the Grimmest Dyke spelling um, from John of Fordoon, where the, the name is first recorded in the 1380s. Although this name is not known from previous documentary sources, it is the only name we have for the wall for a millennium and a half. And in the absence of additional evidence, I think it's the best title to apply for these long forgotten and overlooked centuries. Now this period represents the longest span in the history of the former Roman frontier. Between its abandonment by the Roman military in the late second century and the beginning of serious antiquarian and archeological investigations in the 18th and 19th centuries. Despite this long period, this is the phase for which the wall has received the least scholarly attention. Although some aspects have been published by Lawrence Kepi, 
um, and Adrian Maldonado, and they're discussed in some more detail in my own unpublished PhD thesis. Just a few particular highlights that demonstrate the unrealized potential of this phase include a possible souterrain built into the ditch in the wall's central sector, um, which could have probably served a small community in an unenclosed settlement type during the relatively short period between AD 160 and 220. There's also a minimal collection of available early medieval evidence that's summarized by Adrian Maldonado in a paper a couple of years ago in the journal Britannia, including intermingled and hybridized Latin, Pictish, Britannic, Old English, and Gallic place names, three medieval cross slabs, and a 9th century timber hall at Calendar Park Falkirk that you can see in excavation here. There are also at least five later medieval motts and two stone castles constructed, either adjacent to or immediately on the line of the ramparts or outer mound. Um, and in fact, at least two of these have been um, known to have been occupied and actually shifted hands during the, the Scottish Wars of Independence. So is there a possibility to be looking at the potential refortification or in, in some way a, a, a refrontierization of this earthwork um, sitting across um, Scotland's central belt? Um, and then there's also the 18th and 19th century Union and Fortified Canals, which crisscross um, criss across the line of the wall multiple times. Um, and in the process of actually being cut, these canals, they help to reveal much of it while also destroying it um, with a whole range of other industrial revolution activities associated with it. Now, the full range of evidence for this long phase has not yet been fully collected or synthesized, um, mostly because it's been in this post-interesting phase, according to the Roman frontier scholars. You know, it's, it's, it's not the Antonine Wall. The Antonine Wall is a Roman military frontier, and this stuff isn't related to that. It's irrelevant. Um, I'd like to suggest that it should be. Um, my final phase is the Antonine Wall which refers to the period in which the, uh, the walls become an object of modern scientific research and public presentation. It includes um, studies of the research tradition, the historiography of Antonine Wall research. But um, most importantly, I think this phase not only covers the history of archaeological research for the wall and developments along its lines since the 1980s, but it also represents the wall in its contemporary context as a formal world heritage site, but also as a place where people live, work, and play, including on several of the golf courses, which are, are located on top of the, the remains of the wall. So in conclusion, um, I hope that this new framework um, will help to open the Antonine Wall to wider interest by researchers and the public, <coughs> providing new avenues for research into themes, periods, and activities that have been neglected and to creating opportunities for new appreciations of the wall that derive not only from its original function in the Roman period, but also from all of its other periods and even into the present. Thank you.